Hi everyone. A number of you have been in contact in terms of the coding aspects of the module and perhaps feeling a little bit overwhelmed, I think in some cases, not really getting to grips with what's going on in terms of the coding. To be fair, you were probably dropped in the deep end a little bit when it came to the coding. So what I'm going to do is step back a little bit, go right to the sort of roots of what we're trying to do here and talk you through how we calculate a Fourier transform, do it line by line in terms of the Python coding that you actually need. But also I'm going to go through, the, through it on the board here. I like the mixture of sort of old school shock and talk with, in fact, I'm talking about coding, um, sort of interface of digital analog and analog worlds. Um, I'm going to talk you through exactly what's happening and what are the values we're getting out when we do a Fourier transform on a computer. Use our standard friend, pure sinusoidal function cos omega zero t. You remember what the Fourier transform of that looks like. And actually it's the first question, it's really related to the first question on worksheet three. But what we'll have, And we'll have spikes called delta functions. See video 10, or maybe videos 8, 9, and 10. At minus omega 0 and omega 0. That's what we know a result should be. So it's very, very helpful, to put it mildly, to test code with well-known results. Particularly if they're analytical results, if they're pen and paper maths that you can do and you can see this is the result, this is what my code should give me. Start there before you move into the unknown. Right, so we know that's what that should give us. That's what we're looking for and that's what we hope our code is going to give us and that's what I'm going to code. I'm going to code that from scratch. But, how do we represent that function? So mathematically, we know we've got a continuous function. Time, continuing off there, continuing off there. Etc. First of all, one important difference between analytical maths land, pen and paper maths land and a computer, is we don't have infinities on our computer. We don't have an infinitely extended wave. So we have a, a duration. A wave lasts a finite amount of time. Secondly, and really importantly, is that we don't have a continuous function like this. We have a list, a range of values. Um, and let's say we've got a very sparse, what we, call, what we call a very sparse sampling, very small number of samples of this function. Enough to represent it, but not really enough to do a very good job of representing it. Say that's what we've got. So, what does our function look like on a computer? So instead of having a continuous function of time, what we have is a function where we have, best way to do it is to label it with an index to make sure that we realize that it's discrete values of time. So n equal to zero, n equal to one, n equal to two, n equal to three. Or on a computer, f zero, f one, f two, etc, etc, etc. Just as we did for that um, ball falling under gravity subject to air resistance problem. We've got an array, a list, uh, could even call it a vector, and we'll see that later on, of values. What does our Fourier transform do? It converts one list of values to another list of values. That's it. <laughs> that's simplifying it a great deal, but ultimately that's what it's doing. And moreover, it's taking exactly this, the, the number of values in this list is exactly the same as the number of values in this list. It's just translating. Just as we do in analytical maths, we're going from time to frequency or space to spatial frequency. On the computer, we're doing exactly the same, except what's, all, what's happening is that we're just going from one list of values to a different list of values. So in this particular case, what we'll end up with if that's our function, and let's call it fn now, and this would be n times delta t, each one of these values, 0 times delta t, 1 times delta t, 2 times delta t, etc, etc. 
So our function is defined at these particular values. What's our Fourier transform going to look like? It's going to be another list. And let's write that as F. And let's call it M. Just call this index M. And what we'll have is another list. And we know if we just consider, we're just going to consider positive frequencies. We'll get back to negative frequencies soon once we get to the code. Let's just consider positive frequencies. So what we have here is, again, this is our index. So here we're going to have, if we plot this in terms of frequency, we could just plot it in terms of the index itself. We just could plot it in the raw, in terms of that raw number and say, this is the first value in our array, this is the second. But if we want to have a physically meaningful axis, this will be, this is n times our um, separation between our time points. This will be m times the separation between our frequency points. So, what we'd have, because we know what the Fourier transform, let's say that this frequency here is 10 hertz. And let's say, for want of argument, that our delta F is 1 hertz, that our frequency separation is 1 hertz. I'll explain, don't panic, I'll explain where that comes from when we sit down and start coding this. But what we'd end up with Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Zero, 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 zero. Because we know analytically it's a delta function. We know it's a spike just at that frequency. On a computer, the best we can do in terms of a delta function, we can't have um, Ds. We can't have infinitesimal quantities. We just have one sum. We have one point in our array, one sample, one data point. That's, our, that's effectively the digital equi equivalent of a delta function, right? So that's all that's happening. We're taking one list with these values and converting it to another list with these values. How do we do that? Well, we use an algorithm called the discrete Fourier transform. You will also see it referred to as the fast Fourier transform. The reason it's called the fast Fourier transform is some very clever people back in the 70s maybe, maybe 80s, 70s or 80s, I can't quite remember, um, developed a code which works very, very quickly if you have an integer power of two. So this is why somebody asked me last week, or a couple of people asked me last week, why are you sort of using 1,024 in the code instead of 1,000? Or why are you using 512 in the code instead of 500? That type of thing. That's because the fast Fourier transform, the fast bit, arises from the fact that we've got an integer power of 2. So it wouldn't be a particularly useful Fourier transform for two samples. 4, 8... 16, 32, 64, etc., etc. You know how the progression goes. So if we use that number of um, samples, we get slightly more efficient code. Now, in these days, 21st century, and in terms of the speed of the CPUs, doesn't make a huge amount of difference, to put it mildly, if you use 1,024 versus 1,000, if you're talking about a one-dimensional array. But let's say you've got a vast amount of data. Let's say you've got gigabytes or terabytes of data, and you want to Fourier transform that. That speed up due to the fast Fourier transform can be very helpful. That's a technical computing point. Don't let it worry you. But if you're seeing 1,000, if you're seeing values that are integer powers of two, um, don't get confused. That's the reason why. Okay, so how do we actually calculate? What does the algorithm do? You don't need to code this. This is built into NumPy. We've got the FFT, Fast Fourier Transform Library, in NumPy or NumPy or whatever you want to call it, whatever way you want to pronounce it. In that library, that module, that add-on for Python, that really helpful module for Python that adds in all that math functionality. Um, so it's built in there. You don't need to worry about coding this because it's already coded for you. But in terms of understanding what's going on, it's quite helpful. So what we'll have... A Fourier transform, actually, this is important and is left out sometimes, to get the right values for reasons I'll not go into. If you're really interested, drop me a line and we can go into this. We need to divide through by the total number of samples we use. It's basically just a normalization factor. We're summing up and we, we need to be able to ensure that we get agreement between what's our wave or values for a wave in the time domain and the frequency or domain or the, the values of a wave in the space domain and in the spatial frequency domain. So, 
which would run from n equal to naught to n minus 1. Why n minus 1 and not n? Well, if we run from 0, from n equal to 0 up to n minus 1 gives us n samples because we're counting this one. Then we have our original function, which I called fn. And then we have something you used to see in before, and this looks very, very much like a Fourier series representation. And at this point, you might be getting a little bit frustrated because you'll say, but hang on, you said that the Fourier series was different from a Fourier transform, and the Fourier transform can um, handle aperiodic functions, but the Fourier series can't really do that. Why are we now going back to something that looks like a Fourier series? We're going back to something that looks like a Fourier series because computers are discrete. And therefore, the Fourier series gives us these discrete values. By the wonders of Fourier magic on a computer, however, we still can treat um, aperiodic functions. In fact, all those JavaScript examples, all those examples, those interactive figures on the blog posts, they are, you'll notice, they're treating um, aperiodic functions. We've done top hats, we've done Gaussians, which are spatially localized, not repeating, and the code is happy, very happy to do calculate the Fourier transform. But we've got to realize that we're not in analytical maths land. We're not in pen and paper maths land. We're in discrete mathematics land. So we've got something that's going to look very familiar. And I don't want to fall off the end of the board again because I did that last week. It was very, very frustrating. This, is, this term's going to look very familiar. Where n is a number of samples, n is this index, and m is that index. That's how we do or Fourier transform on a computer. And we're going to code that, we're going to see how that works. But notice, discrete values. We have one list of values, or a function being converted to another list of values. Where in this case, n equal to 0, n equal to 1, n equal to 2 is the index we use for each value. So this would be, in terms of what we're going to do in terms of the coding, f1. And over here, we'd have big F. 0, big F1, big F2, all the way up to n minus 1. Right, that's the background. That's what we're doing. Let's go and see just how, line by line, I'm going to start from a blank screen and talk you through exactly how we code that. Right, coffee in hand. <laughs> Let's start coding. Blank screen. So the first thing we're going to do, I'll comment this as I'm going along, and I will, of course, put the code online. I'll put it on the Moodle page. Step one, import the libraries. So as I said, we've got a wonderful set of libraries. People have worked out these routines, functions, algorithms for us before, so we don't have to go to the hassle of writing our own Fourier code. We can just import it from a library, the routines we need. So we need the evergreen, numpy, numpy, whatever you want to call it. And traditionally, we import that as mp, which just means that anytime we want to refer to that numpy library, we can use np. The other one we'll need in terms of plotting is something called, and instead of having to type that out every time, we're going to import that as plt. Okay, that's our library sorted out. The next thing we need to do is to set up the function we want to transform. So, so the number of things we need to think about in terms of how we code this particular function. So we're going to need our ft values, but if we're going to need our f, f of t values, we need our t values. So we need to think about our time values, first of all. We also need to think, first thing is how many samples will we use? How many values of the function will we use? I'm going to choose n is equal to 1,024, integer power of 2. You don't, it doesn't have to be that. You can make it whatever number you like. We're going to have a wave. We're going to code the, the cosine wave, so we're going to need a frequency. It's important to use meaningful variable names. Sometimes you can just deduce it if it's just x and t or whatever. That's fine. But, you know, if you've got a whole code full of u's and v's and w underscores and s's and t's, it's, it's, sometimes it can get very, very confusing as to what all those variables mean. So just define everything and try to use memorable, meaningful variable names as much as possible. We also need an amplitude for the wave. Let's call that one. And we're going to need a duration for the wave. So let's just call that duration and let's make it one second. Right, so that's a lot of the parameters sorted out. 
we need one key, one other key parameter before we can set up our time values, which is what is the spacing between those uh, time values. And that is going to be our delta t is going to be our duration divided by the number of samples. That is the spacing of our time values. Right, we're now in a position where we can set up an array of time values. Let's call that tvals. And we're going to use the wonderful lin space which allows us to set up an array with a starting value, which is zero. Now we need to be really careful here because if we get this wrong, it means our frequency and our time values can be out a little bit. Remember, we're talking about n values, which means we go from zero to n minus one times delta t because we're including zero. So this needs to be n minus one times delta t and n values. So start, end number of values. Having set up our time values, now we can calculate our function, which we'll just call f underscore t. And we're going to use the numpy cosine function. Also embedded in there is pi, which is defined in that library, and times our frequency, times our time values. And now, Python is clever enough to know that because t vals is an array, that f underscore t, our function, is going to be an array. Right, there, at this point, we could just continue on, dive in, do a Fourier transfer, and keep going. Bad idea. First thing we need to do, just to make sure that that bit's working, is plot it on screen, look at what's happening. This, this is how, how you should write code. Write a few lines, check. Write a few lines, check. Do not stream down, as I've seen students doing many times before, 50 lines of code, throw it all down, press run, and oh, it doesn't work. It's unsurprising it doesn't work. The likelihood of it working first time if you code like that is pretty much zero. So write a few lines, check. Write a few lines, check. So I'm going to put our plotting routines down at the bottom. So now we need to use this library to do our plotting, and we're going to use something called subplots. We set that up as follows. These are the values that the function returns, or the objects that the function returns. This subplots, fun subplots function from this library allows us to plot a number of graphs, a number of plots on a single figure. Two rows, one column. Okay, so we can define our axes as follows. There's um, two sets of axes. Axes zero for one graph and axis one for the other and we're going to set the title of this one we also need to label the axes obviously if we can set x label we can also set y label what else do we need to do oh of course what we need to do is actually plot our values as well uh, which are going to be our time values along the x axis the time axis and then our function we have to show the plot. So let's do that. Right. That looks pretty good overall, apart from this frustration, because it hasn't spaced out the subplots particularly well. So we therefore go to Google. We could spend time looking through the help files, but we go to Google and we type in how to set the spacing between subplots in matplotlib in Python. Click. Multiple plots within space and attribute determines. Okay. Cool. To automatically, I like the look of automatically, to automatically add and adjust padding. Oh, so we need that. So let's take that. Control C it, back to our code, and now let's try it. Okay, good. Let's settle things out and space things out a little bit better so we can see things. The reason I've left that in is Google is your friend. Just t You saw what I did. Just type in the question. There's, you've got a wonderful resource. You can spend a lot of time hacking through help files and documentation. An awful lot of time, all you need to do is just Google the question and you'll find the answer. We're in a good position now. We've got our function in the time domain. So now, and we know it works, so now we'll go ahead and we'll Fourier transform. So we go back up here. And 
carrying out the Fourier transform is actually pretty straightforward. We are going to say, we're going to make a variable name very clear, Fourier transform. And this is in a library. Um, again, it's in the NumPy, NumPy library. And it's called FFT for fast Fourier transform, as I explained when I was at the board. And there are a range of different types of Fourier transform you can do 1D, 2D, um, multiple dimensions. You can think about different aspects of rearranging the, the values in the, in the Fourier transform as well. But what we're going to, you can see, well, there's a range here that it's telling you. Um, we're going to use the vanilla FFT, one dimensional um, Fourier transform. And what we're going to do is tell it. We want you to take the Fourier transform of our function. OK, so before we focus on the frequency values, we've set up our time values and then plotted our function against the time values. We need to do the same for frequency. Before we do that, just so I can explain every step of the process, I'm going to show you the raw output of the Fourier transform. And so the Fourier, the raw output, well, we can repeat some of this. Let's plot it. We can just repeat this syntax where we change axis zero to axis one because this is the other graph and function in frequency domain and we're not going to plot that we are just going to plot and when you tell plot to just plot something without an x-axis it will obediently do it but it will plot it just as a function of um, the value in the array so the index of the array so what we'll have is Fourier transform zero, Fourier transform one, Fourier transform two, and it will just plot it against zero, one, two, etc. And we want the real part of the Fourier transform, which is as easy as doing that. And one other thing I want to do is plot it as points. I'm actually also going to go back up here and plot our graph up here, our time graph as points as well, rather than lines. Just to hammer home, I'm sorry for belaboring the point, but just to hammer home that these are samples, it's not a continuous function. So if we, first of all, on the time graph, now that I've, I've put that in, I just want to zoom in a little bit on the time graph to show you. You can see the individual points. So we've got 1,024 of those points, and those are our individual samples. Down here, Oh, sorry. So zero, one, two, three, four. So that, okay, so that's convenient. And that seems to be working after a fashion in that it seems to be generating the right frequency. Though sometimes you can have fortuitous agreements, so you need to be careful. But in this case, at least it seems at this stage to be generating the right frequency. But why is this so large? Well, that's because, and this is a frustrating convention that differs from implementation of Fourier transform to implementation of Fourier transform in different codes and in, in different programming languages and, and indeed in different libraries. So we need to divide this through by n. And if we divide it through by n, which is the formula I had on the board, good. So at least we've got a half, and at least it seems to be at 4 hertz, even though we haven't yet put our frequency values in. This is just our index. So that looks encouraging now. This is a half. This is what we'd expect for the positive frequencies for a Fourier transform of a cosine wave. The issue is, what the heck is going on up here? Why is there a point up here at well above a 1,000? We know there's no wave with a frequency of a 1,000 in or, or above a 1,000 in our, our wave, in, our, in the function that we're, we're Fourier transforming. Right, this is an artifact of how a computer displays Fourier transforms, and it ultimately arises because we can't have negative array indices. So what the computer has done is it's put the negative frequency values right at the end of the array. I am not going to go into, I'm very happy to bore you to tears as to why it does that and what the reasoning behind that is and why is it placing it up there and how is that valid. 
It's all to do with something called the Nyquist um, sampling theorem. It's all to do with sampling in general, but you don't need to know any of that. And it's beyond the, absolutely beyond the scope of this module where we're, you know, we're using Fourier transforms to help us understand quantum mechanics. I do not want you to get distracted by the, the minutiae of how we code these things. Of course, not doing that blindly and having an understanding of what you're doing, but there are, you know, we don't need to go all the layers down in terms of what's going on here. We can fix this easily, and we fix this through the wonders of something called FFT shift. An FFT shift is pretty easy to call. And what we do is same library again, except the function we're going to use this time is FFT shift. So we're going to say, take our old Fourier transform and FFT shift it and make that our new Fourier transform. Let's do that again. Let's run that again and see what happens. Remember, we still have no frequency values on our x-axis, it's just the index. Okay, this looks good in some respects in that at least it's got the symmetry we'd expect, but uh, they're now at the wrong, why are they at the wrong values? And the reason they're at the wrong values is because the computer doesn't know what the frequency values are. It's it's done its job. It's restructured the array so the um, the Fourier transform has got the right symmetry, but it doesn't know where the origin is. It knows nothing about negative frequencies. So we now need to tell it about negative frequencies. So we need to set up our array so that the computer knows that we've got negative frequencies at this end and positive frequencies at that end. So let's go and do that. So our first step here, we've got delta T. We now need to set up delta F. So our delta F, let's do it like this. Let's delta F turns out to be one over. Hopefully that reciprocal relationship will not come as a surprise, delta T. So there's a reciprocal relationship between the spacing of our frequency values and not just the spacing of our um, time values, but also the number of those time values. So that's equivalent. The longer we make our wave in time, the better frequency resolution we get. I'm not going to hammer that argument home again, that reciprocal re relationship argument. home. You should hopefully have expected that at this point. Set up our freak valves and let's, let's do it in two steps to be absolutely clear what's going on here. So let's set it up like we did with our time values. We'll start, before we think of negative frequencies, we'll say, okay, well, we've got starting at zero, n minus one times delta f and their n values. Now, the problem with that is, is it's, we haven't got negative values in there because it starts at zero. So what we need to do is to take those frequency values and make frequency values equal to the frequency values minus n big N over two times delta F because half of our frequency values are the negative end um, of the origin. So all we've done is we've, we've shifted our axis, which ran from zero to our maximum frequency and we've shifted it down by half the length of the array, which is now telling the computer, here are your frequency values. And so if we now plot, uh, we're now at the point where we can plot an X axis or frequency axis. It looks like that. Let's run that. So it's running all the way out. It's still running all the way out to 512. We'll fix that in a minute, but let's just zoom in on that because it's looking good. And there's our Fourier transform, zero, one, and these are now proper, oh, let me change the, the x-axis. I'm going to do two things here. This is no longer index. This is actual frequency because we set that up. So it's frequency in Hertz. Now I could set that up. You might say, well, you've used Omega. It's just, I could set it up in terms of angular frequency. That's the, you know, you've just got to multiply through by two pi and then it will become radians per second. But let's just leave it in terms of uh, frequency. And the other thing I want to do is let's just zoom in a little bit instead of looking at all those frequencies all the way up to five plus or minus 512 hertz let's zoom in a little bit and we can do that by setting our x limits 
on that graph to, oh, I don't know, minus 16, 16, say, let's do that. Good. One, two, three, four. Positive. One, two, three, four. Negative. We have our Fourier transform. And we've scaled it correctly. It's exactly in agreement with what we'd expect with the analytical pen and paper math solution. Our code is clearly working. Let's have a bit of fun now and put in some different functions. Uh, we could add up a couple, but let's be a little bit more adventurous. And let's take our function and multiply it. So ft is equal to ft multiplied by, oh, what will we say? 2 times np dot pi times, I don't know, 3 times the frequency? 3 times the frequency times t vals. And let's see what we get. So that's a product of two functions, much like you were asked to do in, I believe, question 7 of worksheet 2. I hope that's right. Cos indeed is not defined. I'm going to leave that error in to show you issues and how easily you can drop things. That should be np. Let's run it again. Oh, okay. So we're just off the axis. We have to open out. Um, we have to open out the axis a little bit more. Let's make that say thirty-two and thirty-two, because a couple of our frequencies are falling off the end. Let's check this. So we had a frequency of 4 hertz, and then we had 3 times that frequency, so that's a frequency of 12 hertz. When we take the product of two functions, then we're going to get peaks in our Fourier transform uh, at the sum and difference of those two functions for reasons we described and discussed in the synchronous session, and it's just a simple trigonometric identity. So we should have, let's see, 12 minus 4, so we should have something at 8, and we should have 12 plus 4, we should have something at 16. So we've got 8 and 16. Perfect. So we could go ahead and sum and add and do whatever we like. I'm going to just take that original function, and I'm going to multiply it by um, an exponentially decaying um, let's do that, an exponentially decaying function. So this is very similar to a damped driven oscillator that you saw in from Newton to Einstein last year. Let's have a look at the, what the Fourier transform of that looks like. We will be coming back to something like this in the context of simple harmonic oscillators and quantum simple harmonic oscillators later on. So this is our exponentially decaying of cosine wave and here's our Fourier transform and we've got clear peaks at the at the frequency again this is going to be four hertz he says very hopefully yeah so this is going to be four hertz so what you're seeing here is effectively the equivalent of the resonance curve so if you take an oscillator and you drive it at a range of different frequencies so you see you've got a ruler and you're just driving it back and forth um, with a sinusoidally varying wave sinusoidally varying driving force um, at, at its resonant frequency, you'll get a big response, and away from its resonant frequency, you'll not get such a, a strong response. That's what you're seeing here. And remarkably, the Fourier transform pulls out that resonance curve. You don't have to do the experiment where you run through the range of frequencies. What you can do is take the response of your system, Fourier transform it, and bingo, you get the resonance curve. Now, that's, there aren't so many points in this. Now, you'll remember I said that the frequency, and we can do a very simple numerical experiment to check this, I said that the frequency resolution was related to, inversely related to the duration. So let's increase the duration and make it 10 seconds, run this again, and what we should see is we get a rather better resolved, there we go, curve. And you can see the, the separation in frequency has gone down, Separation in time has gone up, but the separation in frequency has gone down. Same old story. Okay, so I will put that code on the Moodle page. You're free to use it as you like, modify it as you like in terms of coursework, exercises, etc., and beyond. Put different functions in, play with it, see what you get. Always, if you're using it um, and in for a different function, try to find 
analytical solution so you can check your code against well i know mathematically this is what it's going to be i've got to ensure that my code actually matches it in this case before you start um venturing into unexplored waters let's put it that way and um i hope this little tutorial has been helpful and but again if you've got any more questions please don't hesitate to get in contact and i will see you for the synchronous session tomorrow bye